Welcome to World Builders Anonymous. Kick that world building addiction and actually finish that novel with your hosts, Vito and John. Did you did you want to do, do do the intro today? Is that what I was hearing? <laughs> <laughs> We need to, we need to get a consistent intro. This is absurd. Welcome to the <laughs> podcast, everybody. Oh, welcome boy. to the uh, well, the podcast of ever changing intros. Well, we have the same welcome to the podcast every time. That's kind of our our catchphrase so far. It's not not much, but it's our catchphrase. <laughs> uh, there are many like it, but this one is mine. Exactly. <laughs> anyway, I, I think this is the first oh. time you've said it. Is that right? Oh, I've I've said it many times. Don't have on you? your high horse. Uh. I, I could have sworn I did it every You're single time. You're not that special. I thought I was. But, You're, uh, well, no. well, moving on, anyway. <laughs> moving on. Well, welcome, everyone. Right. We're, we're happy to be back with you on the second new episode since our little hiatus. Um, everything's looking pretty good for downloads for like the for the last one we did. Um, so yeah, thank you, to you yeah, guys for been... sticking around for that break and being willing to, to jump back in. We should take more breaks. It's been been pretty good for the numbers so far, yeah. Yeah, this is, we're, after this one, we're going to take another five-month break, so um, <laughs> we'll see you guys later. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Peace out. <laughs> no, 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 no. We're here to stay. So, um, on the ticket for today, um, I have written... I'm, I'm in the process of writing a new article for the website. I know. We haven't had one in probably a year, but whatever. <laughs> it's never too late to start again. Never too late to start again, much like the podcast. But regardless, uh, I'm writing a uh, a list of beginner writing tips, and there are ten of them. And I thought what we do today on the podcast is I'm going to go through these and get Vito. Vito hasn't seen my list, and I'm going to see if he agrees with them, if he thinks there should be others, if they're not beginner applicable. I'm just going to bounce them off of him and see what he thinks, and then uh, if all goes well, we'll we'll convert this into an article for the website. So that's what's going on. Indeed. Okay, and these are in no particular order. Uh, I think I will order them better in the future. But for now, uh, the first one I've written down is show, don't tell. That's a, a pretty basic one, but it's kind of the one of the fundamentals that you have to have to understand and get down for your writing to be effective and, and engaging. Do you agree? Of course. I mean, yeah, it's one of those things that everyone kind of has heard at some point. It's much harder to put into practice because you don't always you don't always know if you're showing or telling sometimes. I know I'll go back and look at some of my stuff that I've written previously and I'll be like, oh, my gosh, I didn't realize that this was coming off this way. Although actually for me, more often what happens is I err too far on the side of show, don't tell. And I, because I have this, you know, ingrained in my mind from so so many times hearing it and, and experiencing the, you know, the downside of it doing it poorly, I often don't tell enough, actually, or I don't, I don't find organic, character-driven ways to tell something about the world. Because uh, uh, I was actually listening to a Brandon Sanderson lecture today for the first time in a while and showing my wife because uh, she had never heard of it before. And it was the one where he talks about uh, the learning curve in your world mm-hmm. where um, for any you know, fantasy and sci-fi story in particular, you really need to introduce your reader to the unique elements of your world that they're not familiar with from real life, I guess. Um, and this is a much steeper learning curve than in most other types of stories because there's this unique element, whether it's magic or, um, you know, different, you know, um, like aliens or whatever it is, you know. Even just um, societies you never heard of, like there's just a lot of ground to cover. Right. So you have to find a way to convey this information to the reader over time and build up to a point where there's a plateau in the learning curve where they know everything they need to know about the story to continue, in, you know, keeping up with it, essentially. But until then, you have to you know, go out of your way to figure out how to convey that information. And oftentimes with new writers, they sort of ham-fistedly just insert it into dialogue with characters who already know this stuff, but they're just sort of spouting it for the reader's you know, uh, benefit very obviously. Um, I often go too far on the other side of things where I don't put it in at all. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so I, I have a lot of in media res type story ideas where I'll just jump into a story that's already sort of in progress a little bit and um, just kind of expect the reader to keep up. Mm-hmm. where I'll go back later and be like, wow, the, the, uh, I didn't really explain anything. <laughs> or somebody else will read it. Right. And they'll be like, I, I really like the characters and stuff, but I don't really know what's going on um, or what this thing is that you mentioned here. And I got kind of confused. So the downside of 
going too far on the other side, trying to avoid telling, is that you can tell too little. Uh, it's not really about telling too little or too much. It's telling the right way, I think, you know? Telling, en- uh, telling the right stuff at the right time. Yeah, and, and through the right mechanism, I guess. Right. Um, usually dialogue is not the best uh, source and internal dialogue in particular, like a character thinking to themselves, "Oh, as I know, you know, it's like you know, you should never say <laughs> as you know, but you should never say as I know, because <laughs> you never think the things that you just know. You you just go about your life. Yeah, you should demonstrate them acting in a certain way that demonstrates certain concepts, whether that's the magic system or how this society functions or, you know, what this fish, little village you know gets their income from or whatever it is you know that you got to right. uh, convey to the reader. It's best to do it through action, I think, um, and dialogue secondarily if you have a fish out of water type character, but even that is kind of a, a slippery slope, I think. Right. And I have a little more about that in another tip later, but I gave a quick okay. example just on a, a dialogue level, or not a dialogue, just a writing level. Um, the sentence, he was getting angry. That's a sentence, and it's saying he was getting angry. You could also say that, though, blood rushed to his face as his temper began to boil over. In that just small example, you're, it's a, it, maybe it's a little bit of purple prose, but just a quick example. Instead of just saying, he's getting angry, you can say what getting angry looks like and feels like, and you can give it this sort of uh, analogy of a, a boiling over. Like you, There's ways to say even small things like that that show instead of tell, even on that kind of granular level. So just yeah, a little totally. and example. Even saying, even saying his temper boiled over only really works if you're talking about your protagonist whose head you're supposed to be inside of. If you're That's talking true. about someone right. there observing, you wouldn't even see their temper boiling over. I mean, you could, they, the character could interpret certain things to mean that their temper is boiling over, but what are they seeing that's causing them to think that? You know, rather right. than just telling us the internal motivations of that character that we don't have access to you know, the inner thoughts of. You know? Right. Okay, so that's the first tip. Tip number two, uh, character first, story second, world building third. Yeah, I like that. Uh, again, that was another thing that um, Brandon Sanderson mentioned in the lecture I watched today, actually, was uh, exactly that, that character should be the most important thing, story or plot should be the second most important thing, typically, depending on what kind of story, and then your setting or um, um, you know magic elements, that kind of stuff, world building should be the third. Although they should all reinforce each other, of course. Right. I mean, they should, they should all be tied together by the conflict of the story. Um, the conflict should have something to do specifically with your specific setting, um, world building elements. It should have something to do with your specific plot and it should be tied to the characters in a specific way. Um, but it, all those three elements should be unified through the conflict that's driving the story forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. And for our fellow world building addicts, it, it, we all know that it's the, the <laughs> overwhelming temptation to just obsess in your mind over all these story and world building elements that, you know, it'd be so cool if this ancient civilization built these ruins, then the story's going to lead us there. But that's really not the best way to frame a story. The best way to frame a story is through the eyes of the people who are experiencing it. And you build everything else around them to best supplement, in my opinion, best supplement those characters' journeys and experiences that are going to make up the emotional core of your novel. Yeah, and it's even, uh, again, even knowing that principle it's hard to do like even now oh, yeah. i still have the overwhelming temptation to work on you know um even today well i had a good idea today actually that led me to you know um a development that allows me to keep moving forward with the plotting uh, but it was a world building element it's where the characters start out the story um mm-hmm. uh, and so it, it but it relates to an event that happened in the past and why they start there and it kind of helped me fit a few different puzzle pieces together that i hadn't quite fit together before um but it was still kind of a world building element um but yeah that's often the the trap i still get into even knowing that world building or setting should be the third um third on the importance list is i'll have an idea of the big macro picture of the world and the political entities in it and i kind of have an idea of where i want to get the characters eventually and this relates to what we were talking about last week with internal versus external motivations Um, but I don't have any reason for the characters to get there in their own heads or in their own Mm -hmm. arcs, I guess. I just, like, need to get them there because that's the cool thing I thought of. Um, Right. And I'm still trying to piece together exactly 
what um, I guess I'm still trying to what's um, driving them what's forward. The, yeah, I'm still trying to parse out what exactly is driving them forward. And I've had to over the last you know many years actually of you know different versions of this story. I've had to get rid of many different world elements that I realized were only there because they you know were kind of neat instead mm-hmm. of having any particular purpose for the character's conflict or arc, you know, and I'm still yeah. working out that sort of kink. All right, number three, use all of your character's senses, not only their sight. For an example, sentence-wise, oh. he looked ahead towards the dirty, cluttered alleyway. That sounds like good descriptive um, explanation, but you could have say something more like this. He pulled his, co- uh, his coat closer to ward off the winter chill, his eyes drawn towards the dirty, cluttered alleyway ahead of him, that was giving off the mingled sense of filth and de- desperation. You have all these senses available to you. You have, I'm not going to list them all properly, but the fundamental ones are sight, smell, and touch. Those are kind of the, th- and, and hearing as well. Those are kind of the four you focus on. In, 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 yeah, totally. Noticed. And using them all gives you such a more full perspective of the world around you as a reader. When you read something and get a a glimpse of all the senses instead of just what you're seeing, you feel much more in the scene. Yeah, totally. I, I don't always think about that, I guess. But that's that's totally right. And if you think about what a story is, it's the most memorable moments from this person's life, probably. Right. Um, at least most likely. And typically when you have a, a moment that sticks in your mind, you have a specific sensory image of it. Um, whether that's something you see, it's often something you smell, uh, it's often something that sticks out that you heard, this sort of sound that startles you. And I, I think not necessarily every scene, but a lot of scenes, especially ones where there's something the character is noticing, it needs to be something big. I often tend to have very generic descriptions, not in terms of like the words I use, but just like the sort of things I'm putting in front of my characters. Like it's, yeah, like just like that. It's like an alleyway, a dirty alleyway. Like, they, like you've seen in a million different movies and TV shows and books and mm-hmm. whatever it is. Instead of coming up with something unique that I'm inserting into there to make it memorable, um, n- not necessarily for an alleyway, but you know, in general, just something that's not going to be so generic, um, right. sensory, sensory wise, sensory, and, sensorily and sen- speaking. I don't know. Yeah, and scent specifically is a surprisingly powerful one that we often leave out because when you think about it, I know for me, like there are certain smells that are so emotionally evocative, like it's hard to describe almost. Like a certain smell reminds you of your childhood, a certain smell reminds you of your spouse, a certain smell reminds you, you know, of of your apartment from college. Their scents get very deeply ingrained with memory and they're very powerful tools and we relate to them closely as well. So it's a really good thing to insert into your story, um, and it it really brings you know another dimension to the um, what's the word I'm trying to think of when you like are in something in um, immersion immersion of your reader. Yeah, it definitely rounds out the experience for sure, rather than just the you know the the sight picture. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, number four, read books. Uh, you there's tons of advantages <laughs> to it. Uh, you learn new words. You learn what kind of story you want to write you internalize what good writing looks and feels like and you often will gain inspiration both on a macro sense of like I could write this kind of story I could write this kind of story but also like um, I I read a book that has a really cool heist in it oh I want to have a heist in my book or I want to have you know these emotional beats that I really resonate with in this story you gain so much so many different avenues of, of inspiration and experience and knowledge and understanding through reading. And I think when we dig deep to write, we think, oh, every spare moment I get, I need to be writing. But honestly, some of that time might be better spent reading and putting good words in your head so you can get more good words out your hands. Totally, yeah. Um, yeah, one, I always hear that one of the most important elements of writing is reading and giving your brain fuel creatively and that kind of thing. It also, for me, one of the biggest things I get from reading other people's stories, especially successful ones and, and good stories, is I, I realize oftentimes that not every single word or, and moment and chapter or scene has to be in direct service of the overarching plot, I guess. You know, right. it, it's hard for me to meander, at least seemingly. I mean, you never want to just meander for the sake of it, but you can have these little corollaries and, and sort of B plots and, and subplots that reinforce the overall theme or arc of your character. And, uh, and that's okay. <laughs> I often don't right. even think of those. And so it helps me to kind of break out of my mentality of like, just get the plot going and, mm-hmm. and 
let me explore the characters and let them breathe and, 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 and kind of um, um, allow myself a little bit more leeway with that sort of thing, which I, I, often, I often find difficult on my own. Right. Okay. And five. Above all else, the, and this kind of might be the need to be the tenth one on the actual list, but above all else, keep yourself writing. Put, you know, no matter what stage, not no matter what stage, but in most cases, I really feel like the best thing you can do for your story is write. Whether you feel like you need to outline more, whether you feel like you need to do this, that, and the other, you know, whatever it is, I, I truly think one of the best things you can do, especially when you're stuck, is just start writing. Keep keep putting words down. Um, it, putting words on the page is always preferable to overthinking. And in that line of thinking, writing is a marathon. And if you treat it like a sprint or or try to like focus on it short term or not not focus on the long term and just generally, you're going to end up disappointed in yourself because you're not going to get done what you want to get done. But putting in small amounts of work every day will get better results than than preparing incessantly and never getting anything done or, you know, any other approach really. That's kind of the way I see it. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I have nothing really to add to that. I mean, I think you and I both have a problem with that sometimes ourselves where I I know I'll just sit in front of the computer for an hour or two sometimes just not even putting anything down or I'll write a little bit and delete it and just kind of sit there staring at the screen thinking like, oh, but where is this going? You know, and maybe I should just yeah. zoom out a little bit, but then I'll be like, no, I should keep going, but then I don't have an idea. And if I would just start typing, <laughs> maybe I would lead myself somewhere, but yeah. it's hard to do because you know, it's not going to be great, but especially in the beginning, cause you don't have even like a starting point. You just have to project words out into the ether and hope that they start something. <laughs> it's so weird to start, start a new story. Yeah, totally. I mean, I mean, the inspiration can come from so many different places, but there's only so long you can think about it. At some point, you're going to have to start putting words on the paper, yeah? Yeah. Okay. And six, dedicate time to writing consistently and dedicate that time specifically to writing. Whatever you have to do to get that time. I've, I know for me, it is a night and day difference in terms of what I get done when I have time I specifically have allocated to writing as opposed to just saying, oh, I'll write when I get time. Like th- this week, I told Vito before we started recording, this week I've, I've dedicated to s- trying this, getting up at 5 or 5.30 and writing for like an hour in the morning before I go to work, before the day really starts. And that's actually been really effective for me because I have now that time that I have no other obligations, nothing else that is demanding my attention. Tessa's not awake, Andy's not awake, like, it's just me, just the computer, and I can write. And I've been more productive in that time than in, I, I mean, I haven't even looked at my story in months because I've been in the mindset of, like, when I get the time, I'll do it, but I never get the time. So you make the time. Make that time consistently and you'll get a lot done. Especially when you have things like jobs and infants to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> the infants in particular. Very demanding, yeah. it turns out. <laughs> it turns out, yes, I'm sure. You um, might be yeah, surprised. That's good. Yeah, I mean that's I mean an important thing for anything you want to get good at or or you know devote yourself to is to carve out time specifically for that. I mean intentionality is just a huge part of life in general, you know, whether it's finances yeah. or or you know dedicating time to things or or whatever else it is. Um and that's a good practice for those other areas of life too. Um d- deciding that this is what I'm going to spend this amount of time doing um and disciplining yourself to actually execute that. And I have not actually done that yet with the writing specifically. Um, I have kind of still have this uh, attitude of oh, when I get to it or when I have a little bit of time because I I tell myself I'm too busy. I can't, can't do it. But, you know, the reality is just like working out or something like that. If you just say I'm going to do this at this time and I'm going to, you know, just, just do it, you can do it. Yeah. And it feels good too when you finish like this morning, for example, by 6.30 I'd written almost a thousand words and you go, ah, oh, I've already accomplished something today. That's awesome. Yeah, and you might even like get to the end of it and be like, "Oh, I kind of want to keep going." I mean, this is this has been great, and, and you look forward to getting to it the next day. And you, uh, yeah. when that pattern develops, it can be very satisfying for sure. Yeah. Uh, writing life hack. This is not on my tip list, but I've discovered that if I leave a scene unfinished in a writing session, I really want to get back to it. <laughs> that uh, it's interesting. Huh. Okay, uh, number seven. Oh, is this seven? I think I might have written 11 by accident. Anyway, seven. (laughs) Reason out your events as they unfold. That sounds kind of confusing, but the point is this. 
And this might not be as much of a beginner tip, but I think it's really important. If you can't adequately explain why something is happening, your reader will not understand it. So you, everything has to be reasoned. And that doesn't mean you have to spend a lot of time thinking about it, but you can't do things that don't have a logical explanation unless you're intending to. Um, like I said, maybe not the most beginner tip, but I, I'm read, I was reading a book. For example, I mentioned it in the podcast last week. In Fate of the Fallen, a character's arm gets chopped off and replaced with a dragon arm. And it never has a reason for happening. It never makes any sense, and it never really becomes a major part of the story. It just happened, and there's no good reason for it, and it made me feel like I don't understand what's going on, I'm out of the story, I'm out of my immersion, and you really can't afford to have that in a fantasy novel because the suspension of disbelief is one of the most important things to achieve. Not achieve, achieve and or avoid. Like, your reader has to be buying what you're selling, and when you have things that don't make logical sense... Um, often it can lead to them not buying what you're selling. Yeah, again, intentionality is everything there, I think. Just make sure that everything that's happening in your story is caused by something and also causes something else. Like, it, nothing that is non-causally related to anything else should be probably there, in my, you know, for the most part. I can't think of any examples of when it should be. Maybe there are, but I can't think of any. Yeah. Uh, so, number eight. I do have ten, actually. I was, I was not foolish. Nice. Number ten, number eight. <laughs> Oof. Number eight. Avoid info dumps. Now, this is closely related to the first tip, which was show, don't tell, but more specifically, info dumping. Um, if you need your reader to know something, you need to fold it into something else. You can't just tell it to them. You, the best thing to do is fold it into some kind of action. Um, but you can also use observations. You can use situ- situationally relevant conversations. Uh, but don't fall into the trap that just because someone is saying something, it's not an info dump. One of the most common things I see, common sources for info dumps I see, is someone going, let me tell you a story. And they just <laughs> tell this. It was a st- dream sequence. It doesn't count, John. Dream, sequ- <laughs> <laughs> dream sequences and storytelling and walking into the bar and there's a bard who happens to be telling the most situationally perfect and relevant <laughs> uh, ancient history story you've ever heard in your life just because like just total random happenstance but he's telling the one thing that you needed to know like the those info dumps through storytelling or long form conversations that aren't um, justified by the story and the situation they're still info dumps even though someone's speaking it um, so you have to be wary of that just on as a matter of principle if there's a lot of information you need your reader to have break it up and tell it over time through various sources. Yeah, I can think of actually, there's certain ways in which you can kind of get around this, I think. One example would be in uh, the Patrick Rothfuss book, uh, The Way of Kings. No, wait. That's the, uh, that's the Name of the Wind. Rothfuss. Name of the Wind. <laughs> I'm in Brandon Sanderson mode. Um, <laughs> Name of the Wind, there's a part where Kvoth is on the streets of Tarbian. And he's been there for a long time now. He's just been, you know, this this urchin essentially for a while. And he happens into this tavern or something where there's this storyteller telling a story that is extremely relevant to the plot that he's in, involved in. But he's been on the streets for years and he's just happening into this, you know, uh, place where the story is being told. But it's happening after like years of him not you know, learning anything. And so right. it's not just like total happenstance. It's, just, you know, eventually he was probably going to you know, run into something like this, but it right. was going to take a lot of time and it feels very relevant and very rewarding because of the, it's a payoff to a long time spent not getting anywhere. Um, so something like that can work a lot better than just like from the very beginning of the story, having your character, you know, overhear a conversation that's leads them to the next plot point or something like that. So right. something like feels said, earned, it's going to be a little bit better than if it feels unearned. Yeah. Yeah. Situational justification is a thing, but you know, uh, rules are meant to be broken and that's kind of one way you can do it. Yeah. Okay. Number nine, don't rush things. Um, I know we all want to get our characters to that big emotional confrontation. There was actually one, I'm reading a book called The Ember Blade right now, which is excellent. And we just had a really big emotional confrontation that had been building up for a long time. And I really thought to myself, this was so impactful to me and emotionally charged for me because it's been building up for so long. If he had, if the author had yeah. gotten, gotten hasty and, and pushed this moment earlier because he wanted to get to it, it would not have been as effective. So 
and, and uh, action sequences are the same way. They're a payoff from the buildup, and the buildup needs to justify totally. the payoff. I think that's the most important thing to realize. I think this is often the case with romances uh, or romance subplots in books. Um, I, I think the temptation is often to just get to the big payoff, but it's not the scene itself that is emotionally resonant. It's the, the scene as a payoff to all the buildup we've seen before it. So right. you can't just jump to the big moment, emotionally speaking, and have it be impactful. You have to... It's only impactful insofar as it's been built up effectively. Um, so, yeah, I think that's definitely something important to know. And something yeah. very hard to do, for sure. I think oftentimes, probably in a first draft, you're just going to have some of those moments. And then I think likely what will happen is you'll go back and build them up a little bit more in a second pass, I think, maybe. But yeah. it, it's, it depends on how you do it. First example I think of when you mentioned romance is Aragon and Arya in, in Aragon. Like that built up over books. <laughs> You're constantly yeah. going like, "Oh, I want this to go this way. I want this to happen." And you, and it was all like hinted at all the time, and it really became emotionally resonant because it, you know, it was drawn out and not the the any kind of confrontation over that was wasn't rushed at all. And even if it didn't have the most satisfying payoff in the end, whatever. But. Regardless, but that first like scene where they like actually bring it up and talk about it is just like so such a you know yes finally kind of thing and then <laughs> yeah, of exactly. course that doesn't doesn't go well but it's still a payoff though it still feels satisfying even though you know you didn't get what you wanted the character didn't get what they wanted but it's still like this just like oh yes finally you know yeah and finally number ten lower your expectations I know that's a bummer <laughs> like that. but I'll explain. So there's a couple facets to this. Um, one, the reality is your novel is going to take a lot longer to finish than you think it will. That's just the harsh truth. Sorry. It's a marathon, not a sprint, like I said. And marathons can be pretty painful. So, you know, don't expect... You're not going to finish your novel in six months and get a publishing deal right away. Like, that's just not, not what's going to happen. When you write, you should write a story you want to read with the express purpose of finishing that work. That's your only goal. Don't, I know I told you that I have a goal to finish the book this year, but I only have that because I think it's an achievable goal realistically. You shouldn't say, I want to finish my novel super fast and then edit it and then get it published. You should think, I want to finish my manuscript. Okay, that's a, you can achieve that. And then you can think about editing. Then you can think about querying. Then you can think about, you know, all the stuff that comes in the future. But, lower your expectations to something that's actually achievable so you avoid burnout. Yeah, not just in terms of timeline, but in terms of quality too, especially that's if you've true. never done this before, um, especially for your first draft. It's going to be bad. <laughs> I mean, there's just no way around it. It's going to be pretty bad. <laughs> and then you're going to make With it better. Promise. That's what you should expect. You know, there's, yeah, exactly. There's going to be grains could, of a good story in there and you have to bring them out yeah, still. Totally, yeah. I mean... But I don't think anyone, I don't know if any bestsellers have been the first draft of the book. I think they've all been probably improvements upon improvements upon improvements on something that was the spark of an idea that became a first draft, that became a second draft, that became a testing you know thing to give to test readers. And they gave feedback and then they changed a few more things and all that kind of stuff. It's a big, yeah. long process that's not going to be quick. It's not going to be easy. Um, but just keep putting words on paper and eventually, hopefully you can refine what you have, you know, the ideas that are coming out into something that's somewhat passable. <laughs> and if you're Patrick Rothfuss, you can just revise, uh, indefinitely. Uh, there you go. so there's or, that too. Yeah. <laughs> to this yes, point, that's... still indefinitely. We'll, we'll see. Yeah. I've actually heard, uh, several people say he never actually intends to release it, which I don't think is true, but how would they know? Who are I these people? Just speculation. I don't think it's true. I think he, I... I think he is trying his best to give us what, what is the best version of the the book. But man, it's taking a long time. Lordy me! Imagine I, I have sympathy for it though. I mean, imagine coming out with your your book and it blows up. Like it becomes one of the most popular things in f fantasy fiction, and then you come out with the second one, and it's also great. And and all this pressure is on the third one to like tie everything up in this trilogy so you know so well and be as good as the other two and and from your perspective I mean you were hoping those first two, first two were good but you didn't really know it was like mm -hmm. you just did your best and came out with it and everyone liked it and now you're hoping to get the same thing and I'm sure it's real nerve wracking. 
I'm sure it is. And he has a lot of stuff going on, too, between, like, charity work. And, and I think he's working with, like, Fox on, on like, a movie and a TV show and, like, all kinds of stuff. And video games. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, all kinds, I mean, of, all kinds good, of nonsense. Good, 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 good problems to have, for sure. <laughs> I like but those problems. problems nonetheless. Like great problems. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. But okay. still, finish your book. And that's finish my top ten office. list of uh, beginner writing tips. Uh, Vita, what do you think of my list? Is it is it good? Did I do a good job? I like your I like your list. Pe- people like top ten lists. I think it's, I think it's a good one. I think you should go forward with your article. Do you think there's any tips that you would have that weren't on my list? Putting I think it hit all the. I think it hit all the really important stuff. I mean, um, there's probably something we could say about. I mean, it's it, everything I would probably add is wrapped up in those sort of general points. I think some stuff like don't focus so much on world building at the beginning was kind of included in your point about you know uh, setting being the third priority uh, mm-hmm. below story and characters or story and no yeah characters and story um, that sort of thing. I think those are good general overarching points that would be good. Yeah, and you can sort of elaborate in the article maybe. Yeah, that's what I plan on doing. So yeah, that's that's the podcast. Next time, uh, I plan we plan on doing some review of a uh, listener submitted piece of writing by a fellow named Michael. Um, there's some good teaching moments in there. There's some stuff he does well, stuff that can be improved upon, um, and he has given us permission to uh, use some examples from that. So uh, if you're interested in that kind of thing, uh, be here next week to tune into that. Uh, do you have anything to add, Vito? Maybe eventually we should have an episode where we post examples of our writing and the listeners can comment on it, and then we read what they had to say about our writing, just to be fair. Ooh, but I don't like criticism. <laughs> My word babies are perfect. I just, like, I just like giving criticism. <laughs> I just like tearing the dreams of others down, not my own. <laughs> well, let us know, guys, if that's something you guys would be interested <laughs> yeah, in. Yeah, sure. Uh, and there's a couple different ways you could give us the feedback on that idea, if you were so inclined. Ooh, segue. For example... You can find us on all the social medias at World Builders Anonymous. I think on Twitter we're actually, I think we're actually WBA Podcast. Um, we're on Twitter. Yeah, we're Vito. <laughs> we talked about this today. I, I I've blocked Twitter out of my mind. Oh it doesn't, doesn't exist to me. Uh, the, the idea of blocking Twitter in your mind is kind of a meta joke. That's kind of funny. <laughs> anyway, on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter we're. World Bill is anonymous. You can find us that way. On Reddit, we're WBA underscore podcast. You can find us on the Fantasy Writer subreddit from time to time. Or just message us on there if you're so inclined. Some people have done that. Uh, you can email the show at WBAPodcast at gmail.com. We have a website where uh, look out for this uh, 10 tips article uh, on the website, www.worldbuildersanonymous.com. And... Um, go review the show on iTunes as well. Uh, my, my recurring joke is that we don't have any kind of way for you to give us money, but we accept iTunes reviews as currency, um, which is not for actually now. true. They're not currency, but yeah. Hey, anything Whatever. you accept as a medium of exchange, John, is, is technically currency. Does it have to be able to be used? Well, I don't expect that you would expect someone else to accept an iTunes review in payment for something you want, so I guess... In this case, it's not really currency. It's more of a boom thing. But yeah, Vito got economized. It's <laughs> <laughs> the first time I've ever done it to him. I win. I, I kind of did it to myself, actually. I don't know what you had to do with it, but yeah. I just pointed out the flaw in your logic. It's fine. <laughs> anyway, that's the show. Uh, thank you guys for being here, and we're really glad to be back, like we said last week. And we're looking forward to getting more of these episodes, more articles, and more writing done. Indeed, we'll see you next week. Bye. Sponsored in part by Audible. Visit worldbuildersanonymous.com slash audible to check out what the guys are listening to right now and to receive a free audiobook.